Hello, welcome to unnamed YouTube channel that I have not decided what I'm gonna call it. My name is Fiona, nice to meet you. <laughs> this is the first video in a series of videos that I'm gonna make doing a deep dive, a deep, deep, deep dive <laughs> into the love interests in Stardew Valley. Characters themselves, their storylines, their cutscenes, their dialogue, their arc that they go on, the narrative design choices behind it, etc., etc. So I think that Stardew Valley gets put into that category of cosy game. And I do agree, it's obviously very cosy. It's my absolute escapist fantasy at the moment. But I don't know if a lot of people know about the complexities to it, the kind of depth that there actually is there. Like this game can be dark. I watched a video recently and they mentioned Stardew Valley and they said that all of the villagers are just like the sweetest people ever. And that's true, some of them are. Some of them are alcoholics that will tell you to go away. This game deals with addiction, the game deals with emotional abuse, the game deals with, even has a foray into suicidal ideation, content warnings will be provided for each video. You know, I don't know if that's something people expect, that, that you have to give content warnings in a video about Stardew Valley, you know? So this is going to be kind of my way to show the depth of the game. I think there's a reason people keep coming back to it. I think there's a reason I keep coming back to it. So yeah, just on a personal side note, um, at this current moment in my life, Study Valley is my hyperfixation. It's kind of my special interest. It's kind of my Roman Empire. I hope that age as well. <laughs> I have almost 500 Ooh. hours in this game. If you type S into my browser, the Study Valley wiki is the first thing that comes up. So I feel qualified to be making this series. Also, I am a professional game writer. I've been working as a narrative designer for the last four years until I got laid off. Hence, starting a YouTube channel with all of my free time. Do you think a depressed person could make this? No. So I'm also gonna add that kind of narrative design perspective. Why I think that certain choices were made, what I think was done really well, what I personally think could be improved or I would change. Overall, we are gonna be taking this game very seriously. Obviously we're gonna have fun with it. It's not all serious. It's got some jokes, it's got some levity to it. It's a cozy game. But you know, at the end of the day, it's just a game. I know that. You could watch this whole video and just comment, it's not that deep. And I know that, but I personally find it interesting and fun to treat these pieces of media that others might just call, you know, cozy, casual, to treat them as serious or, you know, that they're worth analyzing. I think a game doesn't have to be the last of us to be worth picking apart like this. And as we get more into Stardew Valley through the series, you'll see that there is a lot of intention there. It's a game that I found really does hold up when you put it under a microscope like this, especially in terms of the characters and especially in terms of the romances. And again, special interest. I just really, really wanna to talk to someone about it. So today we are gonna be starting off the series with Alex. I am gonna do it alphabetically of the 12 characters. I should start with Abigail. I do know that. I just really wanted to start with Alex because I think it's a, just a good one to start with. Before we get into that though, if you haven't played the game, or you have played it and you need a bit of a refresher. I'm gonna go through how the relationships work, how the gameplay works, how they feed into each other, just so you know all of the terms that I reference, like what's what's a heart event. If you've played the game before, or you already know all of this stuff, you can just go into the chapters and skip this bit and get right into the good stuff. Do you think a depressed person could make this? No. So, Stardew Valley is not a dating sim. Stardew Valley is not a visual novel. Stardew Valley is a farming sim game that just so happens to be populated with all of these interesting characters. You can become friends with some of them, you can date some of them, you can marry some of them, and you can have kids with some of them. So within the game itself, the town that you live in is called Pelican Town. It's not called Stardew Valley. Stardew Valley is the kind of area, almost like a, like a county, I don't know, it's not 100% clear, but the town that you live in specifically is called Pelican Town and Stardew Valley is the overarching area. Within the game, there are around 33 people that you can kind of form relationships with. It's difficult to categorize because there are some NPCs where you can't, you can interact with them, but you can't become friends with them. So for example, Gunther who works at the library, you can talk to him, but you can't kind of become friends with him. The people you can have a relationship with, you get a heart meter on your social menu that looks like this. And it also looks like this, but we'll cover that in a minute. So this heart meter is a huge factor in how relationships work in this game. Basically, as you get to know someone more, their heart meter fills up. And when you get to certain levels, for example, you have two hearts filled up with someone, you unlock certain things with that character. So it could be a cutscene, it could be 
different dialogue with them. They can send you a letter in the post with a gift or they teach you a new recipe. So you fill up the heart meter by gaining friendship points with people. Each heart is worth 250 friendship points. So you get friendship points a number of ways. You can get them through talking to the person once a day. You can get them through making certain choices in dialogue or in the cutscenes. Or most importantly, you get friendship points through giving them a gift. Gifts are a huge gameplay element in Stardew Valley. They're the number one way that you gain friendship points with someone. And this is why the Stardew Valley Wiki is like my number one visited website, because each villager has different tastes. So each villager has things that they like, love, dislike, or hate. They've also all got things that they're neutral about, but I couldn't figure out a good way to put that on a wall. So this differentiation, I'm gonna put this down. <laughs> this differentiation in each character's tastes really adds to the richness of the world. Their tastes are usually an extension of that person's character. For example, Maru is an inventor. If you give her something that she can help you know, electronic type things like a battery pack. She loves battery packs because they're so helpful to her. So it's a system that's really fun to engage with and adds to the realism and the kind of dynamicness, the richness of the characters in the world. Yeah, so the world does feel very rich. It feels very well-rounded. Some of the NPCs are there to do things for you. Some of them run the shops, tend the bar, upgrade your weapons. But a good lot of the NPCs aren't there for you. For example, there are two children in the game and they're not there for any gameplay reason, they're not there to give you a quest or to kind of interact with you in any special way, they're just there to be kids. It's a natural extension of the fact that this is a community, this is a town full of people and so naturally some of those people will be kids. It means that the town has this real community feel to it even though it's you know quite a small map compared to you know GTA or whatever but it's the kind of depth to them it's the way that they're not always available to you it's the way that they have their own routines that makes it feel dynamic so regular NPCs the ones that you can't have a romantic relationship with they have 10 hearts in their heart meter once you fill that up to 10 congratulations you got yourself a new bestie but for romanceable NPCs aka the ones we're going to be talking about it looks slightly different it looks like this so the last two hearts are greyed out you can unlock these last two hearts by gifting that NPC a bouquet. This is a very Stardew Valley thing. You have to buy this bunch of flowers and gift it to that NPC and that's a local way of showing your romantic interest, of saying to that person within that community, I would like to start dating you. You have to have the full eight hearts with a romanceable character in order to get them to accept the bouquet, otherwise they'll reject you. But if you've got all eight hearts with them and you gift them the bouquet, congrats! I'm so happy for you and your new relationship. So the only real change that this makes is you get some different dialogue from them and it also means that you can get to that full 10 hearts, they're not greyed out anymore. So that means that you can get to 10 hearts and unlock the 10 heart cutscene. So it works similarly for marriage. If you want to marry someone, you have to give them the mermaid's pendant. I had to colour this bit in a little bit. It doesn't, it doesn't look as bad as this usually. So if you have the full 10 hearts with them, they'll accept the mermaid pendant, you get married, they move into your house. When you marry someone in Stardew Valley, they add a room to your house and they also have a little area outside and it's all individual for each character and their hobbies and interests. And they're there every morning when you wake up. They are in bed with you every night when you go to sleep. Very cute. So when you get married, four more hearts get added to the heart meter for a total of 14. Hence, this bad boy. But when you're married, you can talk to your spouse multiple times a day. You can give them a gift every single day as opposed to the usual limit of to a week so it's quite quick to build up those last four hearts as compared to friendship when you get to 14 hearts you get the 14 heart event now heart events what's a heart event what is she talking about heart events are basically the cutscenes of the game and they're something that you unlock through filling up the hearts in the heart meter the heart events play automatically when you're in a certain place at a certain time so for example if you have talked to Shane enough times you've put up with him you've given him enough beer and you have two hearts with him, and you enter the forest between 8 p.m. and midnight, you get his two heart cutscene. The best cutscene in the game. Don't come for me, we'll get to it. So for the romanceable NPCs, you typically get a cutscene at two hearts, four hearts, six hearts, eight hearts, <laughs> 10 hearts, and 14 hearts. There are exceptions to this, but I will be pointing out those exceptions as we go. The 10 heart cutscene with every character is always explicitly romantic because you only unlock the 10 hearts after you've given them the bouquet, which signals your romantic interest. Two to eight tends to be 
platonic, though there are exceptions to this as well. And then the 14 heart event is based around the idea that you're married to this character because you only get 14 hearts once you've married someone. It's kind of intended to be like a little slice of life. How are these characters getting on? What is their marriage like? How have they developed from the beginning? The heart events usually play sequentially, so you get two hearts, then you get four hearts, then you get six, etc. But sometimes you might miss one and get them out of order because it does depend on you being in the right place at the right time. But it's usually chronological and it shows your relationship with that character progressing in a linear way. As you move through the hearts with each character, their dialogue with you will change. They go from treating you like a stranger to treating you like a friend, like someone they're dating, they divulge more personal information with you. They also sometimes reference back to the heart events that you've already seen. So yeah, to sum up, basically each character has the heart meter made up of friendship points. You raise the heart meter by talking to them and giving them presents. The heart meter does also decay if you don't talk to them for long enough. But I have a mod that takes that out of the game because I have enough of that in my real life, thank you. <laughs> so one last thing before we get into it. You can date every romanceable character at the same time. You can only marry one person, but you can date multiple people you can date literally all 12 characters if you want to the game doesn't like it when you do this i might cover that in another video but if you're gonna try that let's bring a rabbit's foot with you i hate it when keith wears that shirt we get it you like sports insert charlie day meme here this whole project's been a little bit of an excuse to do crafts. I'm not going to apologise. So let me talk you through my manifesto board. This is Alex. Hearts. Dislikes. Hates. Likes. Loves. You with me? I did buy a proper stick. It's in the post. My neighbour's outside and I don't have curtains in here. So now we're going to talk about Alex. Content warning emotional abuse. So I thought it'd be good to start off these videos with a synopsis. Every character except for a few has a synopsis written for them by the developer that was put out in a dev log before the game was released. So I thought it would just be a nice way to start things off. But Alex's name used to be Josh, so ignore that part. Josh loves sports and hanging out at the beach. He is quite arrogant and brags to everyone that he is going to be a professional athlete. Is his cockiness just a facade to mask his crushing self-doubt? Is he using his sports dream to fill the void left by the disappearance of his parents? Or is he just a brazen youth trying to look cool? Let's find out. So yeah, Alex is kind of a cool jock character. He lives with his grandparents and he's obsessed with grid ball, which is basically, as far as I can tell, it's just American football, but with like a stodgy spin on it. Like, look at the ball. That's a grid ball. That's just American football. I'm like 99% sure. <laughs> In terms of age, none of the characters have confirmed canon ages. There are a lot of headcanons online. One I saw said that Demetrius was 28. He has an adult daughter, so that doesn't really make sense. But I'll just be going with my own headcanons and I'll explain my reasoning. Like, I haven't just pulled them out of my ass. There's logic behind it. For Alex, I figure he's 19 or 20. He never hangs out at the saloon, which is like the bar, despite the fact that his house is right next to it. So that hints to me that he's not 21 because he can't get in. He also still wears his letterman jacket from high school, that's what this is. Which gives the vibe that he's graduated recently, within the last few years at least. And 19 or 20 seems to be the consensus online as well. So Alex was the quarterback in high school and his ultimate dream is to go pro in gridball. We'll get into this in the heart events, but he wants to be the first professional gridball player from Stardew Valley. And he's kind of got this tunnel vision. A lot of his dialogue is about how he's been working out, how he's gonna work out, how he's gonna go pro, etc. Did you know I was an all-star quarterback in high school? It's true. See this little star on my jacket here? That proves it. Sure, it's getting colder, but it's still warm enough for sports. That's all I care about. My grandma told me I should spend more time studying. I was like, Grams, don't fret. I'm turning pro. Studying is for nerds anyway. My little British accent. So he tends to come across as quite arrogant. In his dialogue before you become friends, he pretty much just talks about himself. Or he'll talk about grid ball or the weather or tanning. <laughs> One of my personal favourite lines of his is, Hey player, that's right, I remember your name. That's absolutely classic, Alex. He's also quite appearance focused. He's got this line, I got these new shoes yesterday because my old pair had a brown smudge. I just threw them into the garbage. I would have donated them, but I don't like the idea of some weirdo wearing my shoes, you know? What? 
So from this line, we can also see that he's just a goofy kind of guy. Like he's kind of up himself, he's a bit intense, but ultimately he's harmless and he's quite funny in that way that he doesn't realize he's being funny. Like he's just thinking about some weirdo wearing his shoes. No thoughts, head empty, himbo, king. He's also quite flirty, but only if you play it as a girl. So when you meet him as a guy, this is what he says. Oh, hey, so you're the new guy, huh? Cool, I'll see you around. But if you're a girl, he says, hey, you're the new girl, huh? I think we're gonna get along great. I'm Alex, I'll see you around. And there's a lot of this with him, um, the dialogue being different dependent on if you're playing as a girl or a boy. The beach is a cool place to hang out and soak up some rays. You gotta spend some time in the sun or else you'll get all pale. Hey, do you wanna hang out with me at the beach sometime? Do you have a bikini? The beach is a cool place to hang out and soak up some rays. You gotta spend some time in the sun or else you get all pale. I wish there were more girls in this town, know what I mean? And we'll talk about this more as we get into him as a character. But at this point of kind of getting to know him, it just adds to the arrogant jock kind of image. Like if you're a girl, he just wants to throw lines at you. If you're a guy, he doesn't really want to give you the time of day. He also has this interaction where he comes across as kind of sexist. If you weren't a girl, I'd ask you to play catch. So just keep all of this in mind as we move forwards through his heart events, um, because he does change a lot as a character. We find out more about why he's like this. In terms of his relationships, he has a bit of a thing going on with Hayley, who's a different character that we're gonna be covering in this series. They dance together at the flower dance and he watches her practicing and he says he's enjoying the scenery. He also asks you to say hi to her for him and he hangs out at her house on Wednesdays for a few hours. And if you end up marrying Hayley, he admits to you that he was a little jealous. So there's definitely something more than friend vibes going on between them. This is backed up by the fact that once you get to know Alex better, he tells you, hey player, could you do me a favor? If you see Hayley, tell her I'm busy, thanks. So if they were just friends, surely he could just have two friends. But the idea that he's getting closer to you and therefore he doesn't wanna hang out with her anymore suggests that they do have this kind of will they, won't they relationship. And at that point he's decided they won't. So notable loves for Alex. He's a hard guy to give a loved gift to because he loves complete breakfast, salmon dinner. And that's gonna mean absolutely nothing to you if you don't play the game. But it means that you have to have your house upgraded, to have a kitchen. To make complete breakfast, you need to know like four different recipes. You need to have all the ingredients. It's just, it's a ball ache. <laughs> like Shane as a character, his loved gift is beer. He stands directly next to the bar where you can buy the beer. But with Alex, you have to cook him a fucking meal. <laughs> High maintenance king. So I usually just give him one of his liked gifts. Usually it's beer, even though we established he's not 21, but he still likes it. You can find a secret note in the game which explains why he likes these two foods. And it's because he can feel the protein. And it says that he's learned to love these foods, which implies that he didn't really like them to begin with. It shows his dedication to his training, his routine, his self-discipline the kind of tight hold that he has on himself. Let yourself enjoy things, Alex. <laughs> so notable hates for Alex, we've got Quartz, and we've got Holly, which is a bit random. What have you got against Holly? I'm not sure if there's like a law reason behind those things. It feels a bit random, which I guess is true to life because you don't really have a reason you hate certain things. I hate almonds. I don't have a reason. So now we're gonna get into Alex's heart events. Does it look good? Does it look cool? Crap. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye, I love you. So in the two heart event, you find Alex alone on the beach during the summer. He's hanging out with his grid ball, which he does often. Alex loves his grid ball. He tries to throw it to you and you drop it, which is very relatable content. And he tells you about his aspirations to be the first professional gridball player from Stardew Valley. He says he's already had success in high school and he's just in the process of training so that he can try out for the Tunnelers. They're the local team for Zuzu City, which is mentioned a few times in the game. It's implied to be the nearest city to Pelican Town. Then you get a choice. You can tell him, I believe in you. You can tell him you're really arrogant. I chose the former, I believe in him. So he says, thanks, I'll remember that. If you choose the latter, if you tell him he's arrogant, he says you're jealous and leaves. So okay, we've learned some new things about Alex here. Not a whole bunch to go on, but it makes sense why he's got that tunnel vision 
and all he does is stand and play with his grid ball or talk about working out if you know these are his ultimate plans he seems like an okay guy maybe a little bit self-obsessed ask me a question about me alex so the two hot scenes of this game are generally like this kind of an opening scene establishing the character at their baseline before they go through any sort of arc or change like this is alex before you know him very well this is alex before he started to change or grow or open up in any sort of way we'll go back and analyze this scene later once we know more about alex but we're going to kind of go through it with the information as it's revealed so let's move on for now so the four heart event is where we really start fleshing alex out as a character so you walk into town alex is talking to his dog dusty he's saying no one understands us no one's seen the kind of stuff that we've seen and the player comes along and alex is like did you hear that and you can pick yes or no but it doesn't really matter he ends up telling you about it anyway even though he doesn't like talking about it because he says that he trusts you Alex explains why he lives with his grandparents, that his dad was a bad guy. He was an alcoholic who would verbally abuse him and call him worthless. He'd say that Alex would never get anywhere in life and his dad would abandon him and his mum for long periods of time. Alex tells you that he thinks his dad was jealous of Alex's youth because his dad had wasted his youth doing nothing and got nowhere in life. Which, same. <laughs> Then he explains that after his dad left for good, his mum got sick and passed away, and he had to move in with his grandparents. We find out later that his mum died 12 years ago, so if we're right in guessing his age, he would have been about 7 or 8 when it happened. Then he says there's no point dwelling on it, he doesn't want sympathy, you have to look on the bright side of things. He credits his childhood for making him strong. Then he changes the subject and you get this cute interaction with his dog. So up until this point, Alex has been kind of a two-dimensional character, arrogant jock guy, kind of goofy, fancy Taylor. But this cutscene is where we really start to slice him open, get inside, get all the juicy bits out. So we can see now where that tunnel vision comes from in terms of going pro and in achieving his goals. I personally, thankfully, have no experience of a parent telling me that I'm worthless. But it stands to reason that it would be a normal reaction to that to develop that kind of tunnel vision on achieving your goals to have that focus on kind of proving them wrong alex points out how he believes that his dad wasted his youth doing nothing and this explains a lot of alex's behavior too because alex is a guy who works out literally every day unless there's a festival or some other kind of overriding factor part of alex's regular schedule is working out every day so if he's got this idea in his head of how his dad wasted his youth and then ended up miserable and resentful it makes sense that alex would be working hard to try to do the opposite to try and avoid ending up like his dad it's also interesting how he changes the subject we get more of him opening up later and he does the same thing he changes the subject says there's no use dwelling on it he does mention in this scene that he doesn't like to talk about it so it tracks that he would be uncomfortable and want to change the subject as soon as he could he's a guy who's been through a lot but hasn't spoken about it with anyone the scene specifically starts with him talking to his dog about it so clearly he kind of has that need to open up, even if it does make him uncomfortable. So when you come along, he opens up to you, even though he's uncomfortable because you have these four friendship hearts. This isn't a lot of hearts in the grand scheme of things compared to other characters' four heart scenes. Um, it's quite soon to be opening up so much. So it really suggests a level of loneliness and isolation to Alex. He's a guy who, as we discussed earlier, is always talking about quite surface level things, deflecting any criticism. So in this scene, I can't help but get the feeling like he's dying to open up, like he wants to have a serious conversation. He wants to share the, the pain, the feelings that are inside him. He chooses the player to open up to you, not just because you're there, but also I think because it's, it must be easier to talk about this kind of stuff with someone who's just moved here. We find out later that he's been living with his grandparents for 12 years. So everyone in town would have seen him grow up. So everyone's got that certain idea of him that he's only happy to reinforce through his behaviour. But since you're new, you don't have that idea in your head so much of him, so it's easier to do something different, to go outside of that. Overall, this scene is a, is a short scene, but we can already see that we're starting to crack him open like a little nut. This is what I mean when I said that this game holds up well to analysis. You'd think with a kind of casual game like this that... If you looked at it too closely, if you started pulling things out, then it would all kind of fall apart. But the more that you do that with 
this game that I found, the more questions you have, the more theories, the more you think deeply about it, which is great. So we've got a break in the format here with a rogue five heart event. So Alex is the only character with a five heart event. Most of the characters just have the two, four, six, eight, 10, 14 heart events, but there are exceptions. So Sam has a three heart event, Shane has a seven heart event. Both of these scenes, as well as the Alex one, I would call crucial. There are some characters where some of their heart events almost feel a little bit like filler, but the addition of extra ones just shows that there's a lot to pack into that particular storyline. There's a lot to explore. Like the whole arc needs a bit more space and time to develop. So for the five heart event, you walk into Alex's house and he's staring at his bookcase. He talks to you about how he hasn't read any of the books and the thought of opening one makes him nervous. But you can't make a decent living in this world without a brain. He insults his intelligence and tells you he thinks he's worthless, which notably is the same word he said his father used to call him in the Four Heart event. You get a choice there. You can say he's a genius, you can say he's worthless, or you can say we all have our strengths and weaknesses. I chose to tell him that we all have our strengths and weaknesses. He responds that you're right, we can do anything if we work hard. Then he says we should have dinner and discuss philosophy and the player laughs. And the devil laughs. So first of all, we can see now that Alex has insecurities, which is brand new information to us. You're insecure. You're insecure. Oh. He's a guy who comes across as extremely confident, always talking about his strength training, how girls like his haircut. So it's a good way to add depth to his character by establishing that he's not just some beacon of confidence. Even though he's good looking and he's sporty, that doesn't mean he's not insecure about the stuff that he's weaker at. In the same way that like a more smart person might be insecure about being unfit or having bad hair or being ugly. <laughs> the response you can say of we all have our strengths and weaknesses is a nice concise way to say you can't be good at everything. It's not possible for him to be a genius who reads a book every single day and a guy like he is who works out all the time. That's just not possible for one human being. We all have our limits. So it's kind of like you're saying, be happy with who you are. But his response to this is interesting, right? You're saying, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. His strength is his strength. <laughs> his weakness is reading book stuff. And that's fine. That's who you are. But his response of, we can do anything if we work hard is kind of opposing to that idea you're saying be happy with the skills you've got he's saying i'm gonna work hard and pump up that thing that i'm weaker at do you see what i mean and this could be because of a few things for one he's young he's confident he's not yet aware of his own limitations you as the player are being quite realistic but it makes sense that he's fresh from the womb <laughs> he's thinking i can do anything if i work hard enough it could also be just a quirk of the narrative design it's probably the case where you have these three dialogue options um, and they all lead to an extra line of dialogue. So for example, if you say he's a genius, he says something like, no, no I'm not. not. And then all of those three branches link up again to become linear. And he says the same dialogue that he did to me, how he's going to work hard and he can do anything. So that would explain why it doesn't 100% feel like he gets what you're saying. It doesn't 100% feel like it follows directly on from the choice. But there's another reason I think he responds like this, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So this is one of those scenes where on the surface it's quite simple. Alex is insecure about his intelligence. He opens up to you, you reassure him. But when you look at it with that lens of the four heart scene, you know, the childhood trauma, especially how in the scene he describes himself as worthless, like that's not a coincidence. That's not me reading into it too much. That's not subtext, that's just text. <laughs> so it shows that he's still very much affected by all of this stuff that's happened to him you know that's his dad's voice in his head telling him that he's worthless and that's still affecting his life like he stands in front of the books and he says that even the thought of cracking one open makes him nervous he doesn't try he doesn't you know pick one out flip through it give it a go he's just staring at them as if he's worried that he'll open one he'll read it or he'll try and he'll fail he'll get overwhelmed and his dad will be proved right if we bring in some of his dialogue lines like the one we had earlier my grandma told me I should spend more time studying. I was like, Grams, don't fret, I'm turning pro. Studying is for nerds anyway. So it's interesting this internal conflict he seems to be having. On the one hand, he's going to go pro, he's confident, he doesn't need to study, he doesn't need to read. On the other hand, he's obviously insecure about it. He's referencing how you'll never get anywhere without a brain. 
So we're starting to see his self-doubt about his future, how he's doubting this path of going pro and he's kind of thinking of a backup plan almost. He's talking about how he can't get anywhere without a brain, which means, you know, he wants to get somewhere in life and he thinks you have to study in order to do that. And that links back again to the four heart scene, what he said about his dad, that his dad wasted his youth and got nowhere. Alex wants to not only not waste his youth, but he also wants to not go nowhere. He's been so focused on the goal of going pro as his way of not being like his dad. And now he's, it's like he's kind of realizing he's put all his eggs in one basket. That if the going pro thing doesn't work out for him, then he thinks maybe he will have wasted his youth and he will have gone nowhere. And so we go back to the player saying, we all have our strengths and weaknesses and it not really kind of computing with him. It's like he's not in that place to accept the things that he's weaker at. He's in a place where he's freaking out about the uncertainty of the future. You know, it's it's a nice thought for him that if he works hard, he can kind of bump up that intellectual side of him to give himself more prospects. And the uncertainty in this way is going to be a big theme for him as a character moving on. So this discussion leads us really well into the six heart scene. So I feel like as an additional scene, it works very well. It provides this seamless context between the four heart scene and the six heart scene. So in the six heart scene, Alex is working out. He says he's doing his strength training routine. Sorry for not having a shirt on. Don't apologize. You don't have to, you don't have to, it's me. You don't have to apologize to me. Alex says, sorry for being rude and arrogant. He says he's realized that going pro is just a childish dream and probably not going to come true. And he says, thanks for still being my friend. And then he starts working out even harder. So my initial instinct is to wonder why there isn't a choice in this scene. Similar to the five heart event, you would think that there would be the dialogue option of something like, yeah, it's just a childish dream. Don't give up. I'll be here, whatever happens. But there isn't, there isn't a choice. And that's interesting. So if we think of the progression from the four heart event to the six heart event with the five in the middle, if you took out that five heart event, you would get the four heart event of Alex opening up and then you would get the six heart event of Alex apologizing to you and showing this self-doubt, which would work okay. We would have the context of the, you know, abusive dad, but I think it would feel quite rushed. It would kind of feel like it came out of nowhere. You know, introducing that backstory, suddenly it's paying off. It's a bit, it's just not very subtle. But then the five heart scene really bridges that gap between the two scenes. We can see in the five heart that doubt starting to set in for him. You know, he's realizing the things he's weaker at. He's reshuffling his priorities in his mind. Like it's more important for him to have that stable future than it is for him to pursue this dream that might not work out. And then we get to the six heart event where he's prioritizing a friendship. He seems to have come to terms with the idea that he might have to give up on the grid ball dream. Yeah, it's notable that you don't get that choice, like I mentioned, to tell him not to give up. I feel like if this scene was real, if, you know, you were in the room with him, if Alex is right there talking to me, I feel like you would get the vibe not to say, don't give up. You know, I feel like it's the case where it's not really what he needs to hear in that moment. He's not looking for encouragement like he was in the five heart scene when you do get that choice. The player just gives him that encouragement because it's like he's kind of made his decision. He says, thanks for sticking with him despite everything. And you're, you know, non-verbally telling him that whatever he chooses next, you will still stick with him. And that's kind of what he needs at this uncertain time in his life. Instead of you telling him you should keep going down that path that you were previously on. So I'm thinking about the significance of choices. The two heart scene, you get the choice of, I believe in you, you're arrogant. The four heart scene, the scene opens with the choice. Do you say that you heard him? Do you say that you didn't hear him? And then you just listen to him as he opens up. In the five heart scene, you get the opportunity to give him that reassurance that he's looking for. In the six heart scene, you don't get a choice. So I like the sparseness of these choices. I like that it's not forcing a choice in somewhere that it's not needed. With choices in games, it can sometimes be presented as, you know, letting the player feel like they're making a difference, like they're influencing the world, like they're interacting with the characters. 
but I don't feel like that's necessarily always true. I think I think an unnecessary and poorly timed choice can make you feel way more disconnected from a world. Take the four heart scene, for example. You get the choice at the top of the scene. Do you say that you heard him? Do you say that you didn't hear him? And then after that, you don't get another choice. You just listen to him. He's opening up to you and it's hard for him. And so in not speaking, you're kind of giving him that space to let him work through it. And it's the same with this scene. With the five-part scene, he's specifically looking for that reassurance about his intelligence. But with the four-part scene and the six-part scene, he's opening up to you and you do get that feeling of connectedness without a choice because, you know, he's just bearing his soul to you without interruption, without a piece of player dialogue kind of forced in there. It's more immersive. I think it's well done. Narrative design. Check. <laughs> so let's talk about rudeness. He apologises in the sixth art scene for being rude. I don't think he's rude. Compared to some other characters, he's basically friendly. He can be rude. If you answer the wrong thing in a choice with Alex, if you tell him he's going to fail at being pro or that his haircut looks like a fungal growth, um, then he's kind of rude. But that's fair enough because those are really mean things for you to say. The most rude things he can say to you are, hey, what, you want to talk to me? I'm busy. What do you want? I've got more important things to do right now. Which, to be fair, that is rude. (laughs) But he has all these other lines. Telling you you have a nice tan. (laughs) Talking to you about his workouts. Talking to you about the weather. It's not like he's just rude to you. Like some other characters. So from a narrative design standpoint, it might be that the instances of him being rude to you aren't saved in the system. You know, the game doesn't remember whether you told him that his hair's a fungal growth, whether you told him you don't think he's going to go pro. So this scene needed to be written with the possibility that you've seen his rude dialogue and also the possibility that you haven't, which would explain why he's a bit vague about it. But if we take it at face value, it could be his insecurity coming out again. At this point, you have six hearts with him, so you are his best friend in the whole world. And you're close to him now. You are inside that shell that he had when you first met him, the kind of facade of arrogance and masculinity so it's kind of like he's embarrassed that you even saw the shell in the first place it's like when your partner walks in on you in a work meeting (laughs) and they kind of see how different you are it's embarrassing so Alex thinks he was rude to you because he treats his friends with a a bit of a higher standard maybe and now when he looks back in hindsight on the way that he used to talk to you with that new classification of you're his friend in his head he wishes that he'd, you know, treated you a little bit better because of how close you are now. And it's interesting that he's bringing this up at the same time as telling you that he doesn't think that going pro is going to work out for him. You know, he's feeling down, his self-worth is low, he's doubtful, he's insecure, he's lost that, you know, laser focus, the tunnel vision that he had at the beginning that kind of gave him a lot of stability. So he's doubting everything now, especially himself. I think we all know that feeling of being at a bit of a low point and then saying to the people closest to you, I'm sorry, I'm always so annoying. I'm sorry for never doing anything right. Kind of apologizing for things that you don't necessarily need to. He says to you, thanks for sticking with him, which shows that he values that stability that you've brought to his life, that you've kind of been a bit of a constant. So I guess him apologizing for the rudeness is kind of him putting himself out there. He's prioritizing your friendship. He's showing you that he's not gonna go back to the way that he was before when you first met him he's kind of committed to being this more opened up version of himself around you. And this takes us really nicely into the eight heart scene. So in the eight heart event, Alex is on the beach and he's crying and holding something. You approach and he tells you it's been 12 years to the day since his mum died. He reminisces about her, says he remembers her tossing the grid ball with him in the yard which is sweet, which kind of suggests that this is where his passion for it came from. He says he wishes he could say thanks to her, but he can't because she's gone forever. Then he opens the music box and this nice song plays and this image of his mum holding him as a baby comes over the screen as if to symbolize that she's still there with him. Then he asks what you're thinking and you get a choice. I chose to say that I'd always be here for him and he said I was different to the other guys. I was more sensitive and he was glad about that. Then he changes the subject, kind of like in the Four Heart event, says there's no use crying and you should go back to town. He says not to tell anyone that he was crying and the player laughs and Alex seems worried that you're going to tell everyone and kind of scurries off after you. So this carries on well from what we were just saying because 
he's very opened up to you here. He's vulnerable with you, he's crying. He's openly sharing his feelings and his past experiences. He's obviously a sweet guy at heart. Um, he's crying on the beach, holding a music box. And it's nice to see that element of sentimentality in an otherwise very masculine character. He tells you not to tell anyone that he was crying, which reinforces that idea that you as the player are kind of past the shell, you're past the facade of macho-ness. You get to see him crying and being emotional, but he's still got this barrier up from the outside world. Maybe not to the same extent as he did when he first met you, but um, he still doesn't want everyone to know that he was crying. But he has no problem with you knowing because he feels safe expressing that with you. And it's unclear whether he doesn't want people to know he's crying because he himself is embarrassed by it, he thinks it's a bad thing, or whether he just thinks that other people will judge him for it. I'd argue it's a little bit of both. So in this scene, he's the one who cuts himself off, says there's no use snivelling, but he also values sensitivity in you, the player. He says, I'm glad that you're more sensitive. So it's not black and white, I think it's a little from both. He values sensitivity in the player, but he chastises himself for that sensitivity. And that's very real. The experience of thinking, you know, this thing is okay when other people do it, but it's not okay when I do it. Opening up is a new thing for him, so it would make sense that it wouldn't feel quite right, that it would take some getting used to, that he'd still kind of have that urge to change the subject. But compare this scene to the four heart scene where he opened up to you for the first time. In the four heart scene, he just straight up deflects, completely changes the subject, starts talking about his dog, as opposed to this scene where he simply just asks you, don't tell anyone I was crying. He's come far in being able to open up to you. He's getting more comfortable, even if he's not entirely there yet. Gridball is interesting as a presence in this scene. He talks about Gridball in the context of his mum, how she would toss the ball around with him. Previously, we've only heard him talk about Gridball in terms of his aspirations and his goals and also his kind of self-discipline. But here it's like he's remembering where it all started. It's kind of like if you monetize a hobby, you forget that it's a hobby, you forget that that's something you used to do for fun and you kind of forget the passion that made you start doing it in the first place. If he's been using Gridball as a part of this, you know, masculine shield, as well as a way internally to prove his dad wrong, that he's not worthless, it would have all these negative connotations in his head. Maybe he started to resent the idea of Gridball a little bit, but here he's remembering what made him love it in the first place. You know, it used to make him think about his mum. If in the dialogue choice you pick, honour your mother's memory by always doing your best, he tells you that that's why he's working so hard to be a pro player. So we are shifting away from the pressure that he feels and the need to kind of prove himself um, in terms of being super successful, being pro. We can see that he's thinking more about his life goals in terms of family because he brings it up in the context of his mum. I do think he's kind of in the middle of that thought process here of what would make me happy, what does make me happy, what do I actually want, what would make my mum proud of me in the end. And right now he's still saying gridball, he's still saying he's going to go pro. But as we move on for Alex, we will see that thought kind of develop for him a bit. So this is where the friendship scenes for Alex end. If you don't pursue him romantically, you have reached eight hearts, which is the maximum without giving him the bouquet. So it's interesting to look just at the two to eight heart events in that context of just a platonic friendship. So overall, you get the story of a kid who seems arrogant, seems like he's got his whole life and future sorted out. But it turns out that underneath that facade, he's a sensitive guy. He has a lot of insecurities and self-doubt. And he's had a rough childhood. He doesn't have a lot of people to talk to. And you as the player get to be the one that he voices these insecurities to by becoming his friend. Um, you help him work through them. We see his priorities shift and change. We see him learn about himself through introspection and through conversations with the player. Alex says it best in a piece of dialogue you only get once you are at eight hearts with him. You know, I used to want fame and fortune, but lately I've been starting to sing a different tune. In the end, it's the humble little things that satisfy, don't you think? I still want to go pro, but it's not the most important thing in the world. So we said at the beginning that he had this tunnel vision on going pro, but it, he doesn't have that anymore. The tunnel is a road now. <laughs> and I feel like it's partly because he doesn't have to keep everything inside anymore. Because that's where everything started to change really, is it that four heart scene where he opens up to you. After that scene, you get the five 
in the six and the eight heart scenes or where he's further confiding in you telling you about his feelings as they develop instead of looking back to the past like he was in the four heart so it shows the value of talking things through with a person that you trust how it can make everything seem a bit clearer to talk to someone to get the feelings out of your head and into the world and just have someone listen to you basically it's good to have friends <laughs> i think it's a nice place to take the usual cocky jock trope to give him a soft little heart <laughs> It's also nice to deconstruct that masculinity to show that talking about your feelings is really, really a positive thing. You know, there's the thing about the male loneliness epidemic, how men don't really talk about their feelings or what's going on with them to each other. But we see through Alex's story that it does him a lot of good. So now we are going to take it to the next level with Alex. I think I'm ready emotionally to give him the bouquet. We're going steady. So not much changes um, when you start dating a character, except that you get different lines of dialogue. So some of Alex's include, I've been having a hard time staying focused lately. Hey player, did you do something different with your hair? Something keeps grabbing my attention. I've been trying to do more reading lately. I feel like I've been neglecting my brain for years because of my athletic obsession. If I ever make a lot of money, I'll make sure all my friends and family are taken care of. That means you too. That last one is interesting because he says, if I ever make a lot of money. So he's really starting to separate himself from this idea of fame and fortune. And it also emphasizes how he's prioritizing his relationships. You know, he says, I'll make sure my friends and family are taken care of. So he's saying, I might not ever get really rich, but if I did, I'd give some of it to you because I care about you. Thanks, babe. <laughs> So if you reach 10 hearts with Alex, he sends you a note in the mail asking you to meet him at the saloon tonight after dark. If you do, you'll end up in this room at the saloon that's not otherwise accessible during gameplay. Gus, the saloon owner, is serenading you with a violin. When he leaves, Alex tells you he reserved the room because it's private so that you can talk. Emily comes in to bring you your food with some terrible timing, but he keeps going afterwards. He's nervous, which is basically the opposite to how he usually presents himself. He tells you he was instantly drawn to you when you first met, and it confused him because he's never felt that way about anyone. And I was playing as a man here, so he also says that he kept telling himself, you can't have these kinds of feelings for another guy, but his heart was telling him something else. And you get a choice here. You can say you feel the same way or you don't feel the same way. I chose feel the same way. And he says he can't believe it took so long to say that to each other. Then he eats his steak and he comments on the fragrant sauce. So, let's break this down. Firstly, I think it's notable how his vocabulary changes. He says he's never dined in here before when me, you, probably most people would say I've never eaten in here before, I've never been in here before. He calls the sauce fragrant. So this reflects the quote that I just read about how he's been trying to do more reading. It's working. <laughs> it's a small touch in the scene, but I think it really reflects that shift in priorities that he's been going through since the five heart scene. We've talked a lot about how Alex is bad at showing his emotions. He's uncomfortable doing it. He's obviously nervous when he goes to confess his feelings for you. We get a bit of a gulp. <laughs> and Emily comes in right as he's about to start. She interrupts him, but he powers through anyway. He keeps going when he could have taken that excuse to stop. He could have chickened out there, changed the subject. So he's getting more used to sharing his feelings. And he made this whole plan specifically to tell you about his feelings. You know, he booked the restaurant. He probably asked us to play the violin. Here is the menu, the venue, the seating, you know? His story has been about expressing his vulnerability and also about knowing what he wants. He's gone back and forth about the grid ball thing despite seeming so sure at first. But he's so determined to share his feelings with you that he does this whole thing. It shows a depth to the feelings, like the deliberateness of the date shows how much he cares. And also the fact that he puts stock in those feelings. He values them. He doesn't just brush them aside or keep them in. He, he goes out of his way to share them with you, which is real character development. He knows what he wants. And it's you. So in this scene, since I was playing as a man, 
we get an explicit confession that he's always had romantic feelings for you, but he's been trying to repress them. So the language is, you can't have these kinds of feelings for another guy. It's not shouldn't, it's can't. Like it's an impossibility. This could be because he's a gridball player. You'd expect that to be a very kind of masculine environment. It could be due to his childhood issues, like his internalized homophobia, combining with his dad telling him he's worthless, has just all kind of, it's all just going on inside his head. It could also be that he lives in Pelican Town, which is a place that doesn't have any same-sex couples, no openly queer residents, even though we do come to find out that literally all of our romanceable NPCs are queer because you can romance them successfully as a boy or a girl. You wouldn't know that from talking to any of them. And it's kind of like the don't say gay thing of if it's not presented to you as an option, you're going to assume that it's not an option or if it's something that's wrong. And he's such an isolated guy. He, he didn't have anyone to talk to about, you know, these feelings he was having. And it ties into that masculine facade that he was maintaining when we first met Alex. The way that he would flirt with you if you were a girl and he wouldn't flirt with you if you were a boy. Or how he would say that he wishes there were more girls around. That line about wishing that there were more girls in town really hits different with what he says in this scene about how he was drawn to you as soon as he met you. It's almost like he was wishing that there were more options, as if having more girls in town would mean that he would be attracted to one of them instead of you, as if it's just the lack of options that's making him feel this way. Haley and Alex's relationship is interesting to think about with all of this said. They were kind of flirty and they would hang out sometimes, but when they would hang out, Emily would always be there and, you know, they weren't a couple. And it feels almost as if that's what he thought was expected of him. You know, the two young, popular, conventionally attractive people. Two cute white people going to school together just seems right. And the fact that he wishes there were more girls in the town shows us that he wasn't gelling with Haley. He's not feeling what he should have been feeling. He's feeling like he needs more options. Because if he was feeling those things, then surely they would be a couple. It would be more explicitly romantic. They wouldn't have this kind of friendship, kind of not friendship. So his story is kind of about how he goes on this journey of self-discovery. I think it's easy to be young and think you know everything about yourself, right? Like, you know what you want to be when you grow up, you know what you're going to study at university, you've got your whole life planned out in front of you, just going step to step. But that period of time from around 18 to 25 is when that whole idea gets shaken up, basically. Like, Alex is too heartsy and he's 100% sure that he's going to go pro. But by the Ten Heart event, he's kind of given up on that dream He's realised he has other priorities, like reading books, cultivating his friendships. And he's also realised that he has feelings for another guy. Who hasn't had gay thoughts? Who? So his story is basically showing, like, even the most confident people have doubts. That everything you know for sure, or everything you think you know for sure, could change in a second. If you meet the right person. Life is just change, you know? And you've got to embrace it. And that theme gets expounded when you bring queerness into it. So he's not only got his life set out originally in terms of career plans, but presumably in terms of heterosexuality, in terms of heteronormativity. Date women, marry one, two kids, house, etc. A lot of that is still here in Stardew Valley. You know, you can play as a girl and go through that exact pipeline. Um, it is quite a normative game in that way. You have your two kids, you have your one spouse. But he's at least breaking out of these expectations here. It's easier a lot of the time to go with the flow, to let yourself be washed along, kind of carried along by other people's expectations. You know, just go through life doing what's expected of you. But it's harder to break out of that. And Alex is able to find it within him to do that, presumably because he feels so strongly about it. He easily could have just married Haley, had his beautiful children, but he's learned to value his feelings and to follow his heart. If Pelican Town were real, then this would have been a scandal, you know? So if it was really this town that was just full of straight people and suddenly there's this queer relationship, you know, it would have been a whole thing. He could have easily just avoided that whole headache, but he values his feelings so much that he's willing to put himself out there and face the prospect of other people's idea of him being subverted. So it's notable that you get a choice here of you can choose, I feel the same way. You can choose, I don't feel that way about you. We're gonna get a little bit critical here, okay? So I'm honestly not sure why this choice is here. So all of the 10 heart events have some kind of explicitly romantic scene, whether that's a love confession like this one, or it's a kiss. 
but only some of the characters have this kind of choice in their scene of do you feel the same off the top of my head there's a choice like this in sam's ten heart scene and in penny's ten heart scene of do you feel the same do you not but you know there's not the choice like that in shane's ten heart scene for example to get to the point of having the ten heart scene you need to have given the character the bouquet need to have given the character the bouquet which is an explicit indicator of romantic interest you are dating that is your boyfriend that is your girlfriend so you'd figure that you don't need the choice of do you feel the same for any of these ten heart scenes because you've already signaled your interest in that character you could say that it's good to give the player the choice to change their mind but then if that's the case why is it only in some of the scenes and it's not in all of the scenes i i suppose it depends on the scene like in you know shane's ten heart scene where you don't get this kind of choice there wouldn't be a good point to put the choice it's like i said earlier you don't really want to be shoehorning them in but this choice fits well into alex's scene here because you know he's telling you his feelings you get the chance to respond to them in the ten heart scene with shane where you don't get that choice you do get a different choice earlier so it could be that the goal with the ten heart scenes is just they all need to have a choice to give the player some kind of agency or helping them feel involved instead of just watching the cutscene play out but as i said earlier i don't think that that's always needed i mean the majority of players aren't going to go through and play each of the 12 storylines like i have done recently for this so the majority of players aren't going to notice this kind of discrepancy but it's just something that bugs me i just wish that there was more consistency for that because it makes you think why do some get it why do some others and there's no discernible reason that i can pick out it's, that's a very small thing that's just something that i personally would make more consistent if possible but for alex specifically for this scene we were talking before about the choice placement in his scenes how we're given a choice when he needs reassurance or he needs feedback from you and we're not given a choice we just let him speak when he needs some space so the fact that we are given this choice here could be because he's feeling so nervous because he's really going out on this limb so he's in that position of needing reassurance again, like he was in the five heart scene. I do like that you are given the choice in this scene because it's nice to be able to reciprocate his feelings once he's just poured his heart out to you, especially with the theme of that being so previously difficult for him. So after the 10 heart scene, after you have 10 hearts with Alex, you can ask him to marry you. Will you marry me? Yes, wonderful. He has a couple of different responses. Player, this is the greatest thing that could have happened. I can't wait. I'm gonna love being a farmer. And you get married. Congrats. So as I mentioned in the kind of explainer at the start of the video, when you marry someone in Stardew Valley, they move into your house and they add their own little spouse room to the side of the house. They also have an area outside in the garden. Alex uses his outside area to lift weights because of course he does. His room inside the house is also just workout equipment and a grid ball and also a football. And now I'm confused about what grid ball is because Shane as a character is also into grid ball and he also has a football in his room and he specifically doesn't have this kind of ball in his room. So is it American football? Is it regular football? I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters. Roman Empire. <laughs> Alex is very cute as a husband. He has lots of really adorable lines of dialogue. Ah, uh, there's nothing like a good night's sleep next to my wife slash husband. Hey, when I stand here and look out over our land, I'm really proud. You've done great work. Look at us, with our little farm. We make a cute couple. Hey, maybe it's the golden light, but you look beautiful today. And finally, something he says to you at the Feast of the Winter Star, which is basically like Christmas. What am I thankful for? I'll show you when we get back home. He seems to really enjoy living on the farm. Um, he says he likes working out outside, he likes all the space. I'm gonna get a bunch of exercise done. Ha ha, I love living on a farm. With all this space, I can really achieve a full body workout. So he's still working out a lot, which great. That's fine, that's healthy, that's his hobby. That's what he likes doing, we love that for him. But he does say at one point when you're married, don't ever let me get lazy. I want to stay in good shape for you. Which I can't help but feel is a bit of insecurity on his part. Like, I don't know if we've, if I've emphasized this, but this guy is canonically jacked. <laughs> when he goes to Ginger Island, if you don't know what that is, you don't need to know. He takes his shirt off and we get this sprite. Oh my God. So he canonically has 
this like Captain America body, right? And I guess maybe he feels like that's at least part of the reason that you like him so much. I don't know. It's just the, the way that he wants to stay in good shape for you. And another piece of his dialogue is, oh, the smell? I've been eating garlic all day. I'm trying to stay manly. Sorry. So he's also trying to stay manly. And I think these two things combined make sense. It's not like he is just cured of all of his insecurities and all of the behaviours that he would fall back on. But it's interesting that these behaviours are now recontextualised, right? As opposed to when he was working out every single day to try and, you know, prove that he wasn't worthless. He now is saying that he wants to stay in good shape for you. He's been eating garlic, which is kind of hilarious. <laughs> He's so dumb just sitting there eating garlic. It's also a very far cry from his previous masculine behaviour, which was, you know, you can't play captive, if you're a girl, things like that. Those parts of him are still there, but they're kind of softened and developed. They're for different reasons now, you know, and they seem to make him happy now. Eat your garlic, honey. We love you. Um, he also goes to visit his grandparents sometimes when you're married because he says, you know, they aren't getting any younger, which also shows his prioritisation of his family. So another interesting piece of dialogue you get when he's married is, tell me about your day. It's good to get everything off your chest now and then. And that reinforces what we've been talking about, about how he's learned the value of getting your feelings out there. And it's good that this is something he recognises. This is something that he is continuing to practise in your marriage. It's very healthy. Very healthy marriage. So another thing that he says is, I never had many friends in town. I sometimes wonder how I'd end up if you never moved here. And I think this is interesting because it's true. He doesn't have a lot of friends. Other people, you see them hang out with each other. Sam and Sebastian play pool. They hang out with Abigail. Maru and Penny have a friendship. They kind of sit on the bench together sometimes. But Alex, sometimes Alex would hang out with Haley. but, you know, we've already established that that wasn't necessarily a friendship. And apart from that, he spends a huge amount of his time alone. So this is definitely in part due to his determination to go pro. It, you know, he works out so much. During the winter, he goes to the spa and he works out there every single day away from everyone else. But I think this piece of dialogue also recontextualizes that very first two heart scene. I told you we'd come back to it. In that scene, he literally only talks to you about Gridball. You know, he says, go long. He tells you about his aspirations. It's like it's the only way he knows to connect with people. So we find out that this kind of masculine persona is a bit of a mask, it's a bit of a facade. And I feel like that is also a kind of barrier that stopped him from developing these friendships. We don't get to hear him talk to Haley. we don't get to see that, but I wonder if, you know, if it were real, if we got to see their conversation, if he would only be talking about Gridball with her as well and potentially everyone else. And he spends a lot of his time standing outside his house playing with his grid ball. And it's kind of like he's waiting for someone to come and talk to him. He seems like a lonely guy. So that just makes it kind of more impactful that he finds a friend in you, in the player. That's the player's kind of role in Alex's story. So if you end up having two kids with Alex, you can adopt kids if you are a same sex couple. He says, I finally have the family life that I missed out on as a kid. Thank you. Okay, first of all, crying, shitting, throwing up. <laughs> Very sweet. Second of all, we've talked about Alex and the idea of certainty and stability. He gave up on the gridball thing because it wasn't a sure thing. He's grateful to you for sticking by him, for being consistent. He had all that worry that came about when he didn't know what to do with his life. But there's also the thing of how his he says that his dad was gone a lot, how he would just kind of leave at random times. So... He never had that sense of stability as a kid that you kind of need. And even when his dad was around, it wasn't a great time because he would treat him and his mum really badly. And now Alex has got that stability. He's got peace almost. He's got that certainty and he's grateful. He says to you, you know, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so before we move on to the 14 hut scene, I just have to show you one more piece of his married dialogue. It's one of my favourite pieces of Alex dialogue. After you've had one child with him, he says... I wonder what it's like to be pregnant. Just such a pure soul, a pure jacked soul. <laughs> I just moved the light because the sun is setting outside. It's getting a bit spooky. So 14 heart event. Look how far we've come. Look how much we've covered. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of me. I guess this is a good time to just add in a little ad lib about how this is my first 
YouTube video I have ever made in my whole life. So please be nice to me. <laughs> please be nice to me. Like and subscribe. Yeah, I'm going to be putting out the other 12 parts in this series. We're going to do Abigail, then we're going to do Elliot, then we're going to do Emily, etc, etc. It's going to be a fun time. There's going to be lots of things printed out, lots of props. I have a lot of ideas for other stuff as well, so we'll see how things go. But yeah, if you want to follow along, give me a little subscribe. It would be appreciated. <laughs> 14 hat event. One day when you leave the house, Alex asks you if he can have 5,000 G for a project he's working on. G is the currency in Stardew Valley. The exchange rate is not clear. He says, even though you have a joint account, he figured he should ask you. I said yes. And he says to come to the saloon on a Sunday to see the end result of the project. So then there's a second part to the scene. You go to the saloon on Sunday. He's turned this part of the saloon into kind of a grid ball watching area. Um, previously in that area, there were just kegs and it was kind of a back room. All of the lads are there. You've got George, you've got Gus, Kent and Shane, and they're watching a grid ball game together. Alex says to you about how he used to dream of being an athlete someday, but his life turned out different. He's happy, but he wanted to keep part of the dream alive in a small way by making this place where the guys could hang out and watch the games. Then he gets some affirmation from the lads. George says he feels young again. Kent is happy to get out of the house and take his mind off of things. Shane says same. Gus says that it's good for business, but it's not good for Shane's liver. <laughs> Classic joke. He's got substance abuse issues. Hilarious. And then after the cutscene, when you get home, Alex says to you, thank you for the money. It was a fun project. So it's now 100% clear cut that he's given up on this dream of going pro. It was kind of ambiguous there for a while. He hinted in the six heart, he said, it might be a childish dream. In that eight heart piece of dialogue that we looked at, he said, you know, he still wants it, but it's not the most important thing. But now in this 14 heart scene, we have confirmation that he's done with that. And look, initially I had this whole bit written about how that's kind of weird. Why did he just give up on this dream? when he married you? Why can't he do both? You know, we only ever got the idea that he thought, maybe I'm not cut out for it, maybe it's not gonna happen for me. We never got any kind of idea that he doesn't want it. But thinking about it now, going back and kind of revising my opinion, I just don't think that going pro is what he wants anymore. Like, he's shed the idea that you have to follow the expectations of people around you. He knows that he values family and he values stability above things like fame and fortune. He finds happiness working out at home instead and watching the game with boys. Personally, I do think it's a shame that he worked so hard for so long and doesn't pursue this goal anymore. But at the end of the day, you know, this is what he wants. Who am I to tell him it's wrong? It might be a shame, but you know, that's what's best for him because that's what he wants. I feel like this as an outcome for him has been so foreshadowed so cemented in his growth as a character. You know, I feel like we've been building to this through the course of this video, that he wouldn't end up pursuing going pro anymore. That I feel like it's so built up that even if it ends up being a little bit anticlimactic, good for him. You know, he's happy with an anticlimax. He's happy with his humble life. He tells you in this scene that he's happy and I believe him. So it goes back to that quote that we read before. In the end, it's the humble little things that satisfy don't you think? He spent so long hyper fixating on this one goal to go pro that when he stops and looks around outside of that, there's lots of things, lots of other things that make him happy. I think maybe it was kind of a coping mechanism, um, basing his whole identity around grid ball and around that one goal. And now he's given himself permission to let that go. He's happier than he's ever been. He loves living on the farm. He loves life with you. He's obviously still thinking about the grid ball stuff during this 14 heart event, but it seems healthy of him to create this club instead of just sitting and ruminating on it. He could easily end up resenting you for being the reason that he didn't achieve his dream, being the reason he didn't go pro. But instead of doing that, he's made this decision to turn it into a positive thing to make the club. And you know, it's a positive thing that benefits other people as well. It kind of fosters that sense of community. And he's being social as well, it's a social thing. Especially after, as we mentioned, he spent so long without friends, it's notable that 
that's where his mind goes that's where his priorities are the guys he's hanging out with this in this scene are people he's basically never interacted with before as far as we know so in that way the 14 heart scene really shows that alex has achieved his ultimate goal which was not to be like his dad his dad resented alex and alex has the opportunity to resent you and he doesn't if you 100% the game, you get access to a special area on the map that's called the Summit, and you get a special cutscene as a reward and your spouse joins you up there, you get a special piece of dialogue from them. This piece of dialogue in theory would be the last thing that you would see when playing the game. You know, you've 100%ed it, what else is there to do? So it's kind of similar how with the 14 heart events, the assumption is that the player has been playing for a while in order to get to that level with someone, and the 14 heart event is supposed to kind of represent like a slice of your married life with the summit dialogue it's all kind of very representative of that character and the journey that you have taken with them so alex says i finally discovered who i want to be and i feel certain about the future i don't think i would have gotten here without you player and look that just sums it up doesn't it he's finally discovered who he wants to be he feels certain about the future and it's all because of you and this journey that you've taken together through the game. I wish them many happy years of marriage, except in making this video, I went through and I dated and married and then divorced all of the characters. Oh, I have 11 exes <laughs> in that safe file now. So I ended up divorcing Alex pretty much right after his 14 heart event and honestly, it actually genuinely made me really sad. I'm very parasocial with these fictional characters at this point. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alex. So just briefly, when you divorce someone in Stardew Valley, they only have one line of dialogue that they will ever say to you ever again. And Alex's is, I thought we had something special. I guess I was wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. My jock husband. My jock ex-husband. Look at that little blush. So I've reached the end of my 11,000 word script on one character from Stardew Valley. Thank you so much for watching this video with me. I really hope that you enjoyed it. I had a really fun time making it. As I said before, this is my first video ever. So if it's bad, don't tell me. Well, you can, I will accept constructive criticism. Maybe a compliment sandwich. <laughs> I'm going through a bit of a weird time in my life and this game has become basically escapism for me. And it's actually kind of a nice feeling. I haven't had a special interest like this in a while since I was like a teenager, like writing my Stardew Valley fan fiction. So it's nice to make something productive out of it. And hopefully, you know, other people will get something out of it. Hopefully you have a good time watching. This was one of 12. There are 11 other characters that we are gonna dive this deep in. I'm gonna print some more shit out. <laughs> gonna get more blue tack. And it's gonna be a fun time. So if you want to stick around and watch those videos when they come out, subscribe to my channel. Okay, I hope that you have a good day.